everyone. Yes, there's a body and a face with that voice. Um, thank you so much for being here for our first ever What's Next Summit. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining on the live stream. The hashtag, by the way, is What's Next Summit if you would like to join us there. We've talked about so many things today. Um, such a wonderful conversation this morning with Jose Andres. We talked about cryptocurrency, electric everything. We wanted to have a conversation about an issue that is so important to this time which is climate and climate change, which is why I'd like to welcome to the stage Ali Zaidi, who's the Deputy National Climate Advisor for the White House. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. So I know this summit is called What's Next, but I feel like we do have to start in this present moment before we can get to the future. And I wanted to start by asking if you thought your time in the Biden administration as a climate advisor was going to include the largest strategic oil release in our history, a million barrels a day. You know, one of the things that you learn, um, especially working in climate, is to start to expect the unexpected. <laughs> And, you know, we see that with every release of the United Nations IPCC, that's the panel of scientists with their reports, um, things getting worse, things getting challenging, um, and a bunch of uncertainty built into the models and into reality. Um, and, you know, it's an uncertainty that folks are living with in their communities right now. Um, uh, what will be the extent of the drought uh, for farmers planning uh, the next set of crops, uh, what will be the reach of the wildfires for folks wondering if their cabin's gonna still be standing at the end of the season. Um, and part of what's been challenging is these exogenous factors um, and war being the most grave uh, among them. How do we uh, respond to that? And I think for President Biden, for our allies and partners, um, this has been a moment of stealing our resolve on tackling the climate crisis and recognizing that real energy independence, real energy security is not something we're gonna find at the bottom of a well. It's gonna be something we find by accelerating our shift to clean energy. Um, uh, drawing power from the sun, uh, drawing power from wind and storing it, uh, energy like nuclear and hydro. Um, and, you know, we've been, I think, accelerating our pace there. And, and one of the things that was notable and I think important about the, the set of conversations the president had during his trip in Europe was a redoubling of that commitment. Uh, to making sure that we follow through on the ambition we've laid out in Paris and then in Glasgow. So how do you thread the needle on the messaging for that? Because that's a lot of nuance that you just described there, right? That we have these immediate short-term needs, but that there are just as pressing future changes that we need to make. I think the it is nuanced, you're right. Uh, but in a way, it's actually very simple. And I think it's actually very much part of the DNA of the unique way in which Joe Biden has advanced climate action. And that is to meet people where they are. Um, you know, when he goes and talks about the electric vehicle revolution, he's going to Dearborn and to Detroit, got a chance to go with him, and talking to those workers who've been on the line in certain cases for decades, meeting them where they are and talking about the transformation and opportunity in front of us. And I think in this instance, he's meeting folks where they are, which is feeling uh, the pain of Putin's price hike uh, at the gasoline pump, stabilizing that situation uh, through extraordinary action and leadership, and then making sure we're moving as boldly and vigorously in the direction of a clean energy future as we can. So it's, I think it is a little bit nuanced, but I think it is simple in the sense that if we're gonna be successful on climate, 
it's going to be because we took the time to listen to people, meet them where they are, and deliver solutions that are going to resonate in their lives today. And do you think that message is getting out there? I think so. And, and you know, I think part of it is making sure that we are uh, being relentless in, in delivering that. Because I think, you know, there's so much about climate that can make you despondent. Um, whether it's the latest scientific news or uh, the reality we see in our communities or sometimes progress being stalled or stymied by folks who'd rather not make that progress. Um, but, you know, part of what makes me uh, show up to work uh, being as excited as I am every day is that I work for someone who is deeply and profoundly optimistic. Uh, and I think that's the only way you can, you can move forward. So obviously you do work very closely with the president. How does he talk about, like how does he process this personally, like all of the, like this pressing weight of climate change? How do you all talk about it? You know, it's, it's, it, it, it actually resonates a lot with me. Um, and maybe it's because he's from Scranton and I grew up outside of Erie. Um, but the way, and I think he's just got a profound talent for this, um, that he grounds these conversations around big, weighty issues of public policy um, in the very specific and granular way that people feel them in their lives. Um, that's, that's the conversation we have, is what is this going to mean for people's sense of purpose and dignity? Uh, for their jobs that help them provide for their families and give them that sense of purpose. Um, and, you know, I think he presses his team to, to not just be greenhouse gas accountants, because uh, it's easy for us to go in and say, well, you know, you do this, you turn this knob and you get 100 million metric tons, and you turn this knob and you lose 50 of those, and that's why we got to do... Uh, X, Y, or Z, and our, you know, econometric analysis suggests whatever, and that's important to him, that everything adds up. Um, but I think he really presses us to say, okay, but who's the person on the other side of that? So I do have a greenhouse gas accounting question for you, um, which is also I think falls under the category of despondent. But um, you and climate scientists yesterday gave governments a final warning in a new report out that said to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change, emissions have to peak by 2025, so just in three years. And my colleague Andrew Friedman and I were talking about it yesterday, and he called it a cold slap of water to the face. <laughs> um, the idea that emissions also have to decline by almost half by 2030. So how do you see us making that? Uh, a few different ways. Uh, you know, I liken it to, um, football, although we were in March Madness, and what a game yesterday. Uh, but I'll use the football analogy nonetheless. Um, we've got to run a, we've got to operate a running game and a passing game at the same time. The running game is, we know we've got some technologies that are ready to be deployed right now. And, and you go buy by the pound, and you sort of make progress inch by inch, yard by yard. That's the deployment of uh, electric vehicles, that's the deployment of solar and wind and storage. It's the retention of key, uh, key assets like our nuclear assets. It's the bolstering of efficiency of assets like hydropower. That's not just true here in the United States. We got to do that all around the world. And then the second is making sure at the same time we're throwing the ball down the field. Um, and, and there I'm thinking about technologies like our electrolyzers. Um, so for the longest time, we've said, hey, you know, steel, cement, aluminum, heavy industry, very hard to decarbonize. Let's talk about that tomorrow. And uh, that, that moment is now. We can no longer wait. And so that's what's been exciting as we've been, as we've tried to be making those running yard gains. We've also been looking down the field at those technologies that are going to help us change the equation. And part of it is not just 
reducing what we put into the sky, but it's actually pulling the carbon out of the ambient uh, uh, environment, out of the atmosphere, and that's direct air, car uh, direct air capture technologies where we secured over $10 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law to advance that. And, you know, Joe Biden was the first person who's ever mentioned cover crops at a joint session of Congress. Uh, our farmers and ranchers are going to be part of that solution, too. And so how do you see this working, these technologies in specific industries like agriculture? What do you think is working right now? You know, in, in agriculture, one of the things that I'm particularly excited about is the shift we're seeing on sustainable aviation fuels. And that's something where we've proposed uh, tax credit, we've uh, proposed uh, increased infrastructure investment, but we now are seeing not only a concept of sustainable aviation fuels in the laboratory, but literally planes flying from in the case of uh, one of our domestic airlines from Chicago to, to Washington, D.C., on sustainable aviation fuels. So we got to hasten that to the marketplace, and that's opportunity for farmers and ranchers. A second thing that we're seeing is the advancement of these carbon capture uh, technologies, whether it's the research and development in plants that have deeper roots and bigger leaves, uh, or it's this cover cropping that helps do better soil carbon management, uh, which is going to be critical to our future. And then it's important to remember, as you know, as someone who did grow up in a rural community, that there's a ton of other climate and clean energy opportunity in rural communities that we also have to be laser focused on. And that means being a partner to our rural co-ops as they make the transition uh, to bringing the savings that can come from solar and wind and efficiency uh, onto the grid. So we gotta, we gotta invest in that. And so when you think about things like aviation or sustainable aviation fuels, how much appetite is there in Congress to incentivize that? As you sort of, and I'm thinking about this in context of how things have gone over the past year as you, of thinking about different climate initiatives within Congress. Yeah, I think, look, one of the things that's, that's stark to me, um, having sort of walked out of the gates uh, in January 2017 at the White House and then walked back in uh, January 2021, um, is how much the political economy around this stuff has changed. And a big reason I think that the political economy has changed is one, these are no longer jobs that people are talking or writing about, they're jobs people are working. Uh, and they're not jobs on another planet, they're here in our communities. And second, the technologies are more ready to be harnessed. So we're seeing a ton of um, uh, appetite, I think, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and the bipartisan infrastructure law is a good example of that, where we got seven and a half billion dollars to invest in building out our charging infrastructure around the country. That's gonna be electrical workers uh, who are building out that network, and that's gonna help us accelerate the deployment of electric vehicles. So I think there is uh, excitement. And there's excitement in things that, again, used to feel a little esoteric uh, that are pretty real now. Um, I'll give you an example of cement. So if cement were a country with 8% of the world's CO2 coming from cement processes, it would be one of the five largest polluters in the world. And now we've got tools from carbon capture where we've cut the cost in half over the last decade to green hydrogen where we have a line of sight to $1 a kilogram where we can make that cement without fouling the environment. And so I think people are really excited about that because it uh, helps us build a competitive edge here in the United States. And uh, we're seeing excitement for carbon capture, for electrolyzers, uh, again, in both chambers and on both sides of the aisle. My podcast listeners have been texting me questions about climate change, and we've been answering them over the past couple of months. And I got a message from a listener who asked about what additional evidence lawmakers who are skeptical of climate change science need in order to take this seriously. From your perspective as a former Republican, what do you think could make a difference in bridging that divide? You know, I, I don't know what more scientific evidence is necessary. Um, uh, this is not uh, 
a few scientists, it's not many scientists, it's not most scientists. This is uh, the judgment of the global scientific community. And, you know, you don't need uh, a degree in rocket science to go and see our communities being burned to the ground. You don't need a degree in rocket science to see the sea levels rise and threaten homes and livelihoods. You don't need a degree in rocket science to understand that what we are perceiving hundreds of billions of dollars of damage year over year is on a hockey stick. Uh, and it's getting worse if we don't take action in a bold way. I do think this goes back to, to what the president, I think, pushes his team to do, is we gotta meet folks where they are. Um, and, you know, oftentimes that's a concern around those kitchen table issues. Where's my job gonna be tomorrow? Where's, um, it, you know, am I gonna be able to pay the utility bills and so on and so forth? And harness climate action as a solution for those concerns. And that's what we're trying to do. So just sidestep it, really, because. I, I just don't know that folks wanna, that everybody wants a lecture in science. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people are wrapped up in grappling with their day-to-day -day challenges. And our job is to help people tackle the challenges that are right in front of them, whether it's wildfire and drought, uh, whether it's job security and energy bills. And it turns out that climate change and, and the action that we need to take to tackle it is actually a really great sword in attacking those other challenges as well. So you're in this every day, you're reading all of these reports, you're having all of these policy conversations. Do you have your own personal climate anxiety that I feel like I talk about with a lot of people all the time about just <laughs> worrying about everything? Um, you know, my, I don't know that that's what motivates me. Um, I was with the vice president yesterday. Uh, we went to Thomas Elementary School and we sat around the room uh, at one point with uh, five kids, I think eight to 10. And one of them almost leapt out of their seat to tell the vice president that he had figured it out. He'd figured out how we could keep people from going to the hospital uh, because they'd been breathing all this gunk into their lungs um, by helping our vehicles run on solar. He said, electricity is the solution. And the vice president just soaked that in and told him about these electric school buses she'd seen be manufactured on one of her trips. It's not anxiety that propels me, it's a sense of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's a sense of opportunity that, that we can see in the eyes of those kids at Thomas, Thomas Elementary. It's the sense of opportunity I think about, you know, there's this, I, I tend to process a lot through the prism of, of where I grew up. In Erie, um, uh, they used to manufacture locomotives for the longest time, including when I was growing up there. And today, uh, what used to be GE Transport is now this company called Wabtec. And they are uh, manufacturing electric locos in Erie in factories that seem like they were gonna get shuttered. Um, and factories that have been around since the 50s and 60s, places like Seaway, Window, um, folks who've been manufacturing windows for the longest time are now putting a little bit more coating, uh, a little bit different technology, uh, and are now part of the revolution to make our buildings more efficient. So I get excited about the opportunity. I think there's plenty of gloom and doom out there in the world. And, um, you know, and I take the cues from that kid at Thomas Elementary, I take my cues from uh, the folks who've been marching and striking and calling for action, impatient um, young people, and from the folks I've had a, the great fortune of meeting um, 
following the president around in some of these places, uh, the people who just want to put um, a good meal and an opportunity and their sense of optimism on the kitchen table for their families. Well, thank you for ending us on a hopeful note. We will have to leave it there. Um, White House Deputy National thanks Climate so Advisor Ali Zaidi, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.